Healthcare is changing, and Dr. Nancy R.N. is here for you. The topics are many, but each program stands on its own with three key action points for you to learn. Your guide to a healthier you in a changing world. Dr. Nancy R.N. Welcome to Dr. Nancy R.N. Healthy world, healthy nation, healthy you. I'm Nancy Valentine, PhD and registered nurse, and this show is dedicated to you, the healthcare consumer. And today we're having another installment in an exciting series entitled Tales of a Family Caregiver. And our tale teller is Dr. Gloria Donnelly, who is Professor and Dean of Nursing and Health Sciences at Drexel University here in Philadelphia. And our show topic today is entitled Dealing with the Many Faces of Dementia. Many of us are dealing with this with friends or family members. You may be taking care of these people at home or you may not, but whatever it is that you are dealing with, you will learn something very important in this show because we are going to be outlining and discussing the fi final following areas. One is prevalence of dementia. It is really a very difficult illness and it is growing in the United States. We're gonna talk about the signs and symptoms, memory loss, sundowning, a term that you may have heard, personality changes, and what to do with agitation and depression among this population. We're also gonna be talking about how to differentiate dementia from depression because they really are two different disorders. They may go hand in hand, but it's really important to know the difference because some of the interactions and things that you will be doing will be somewhat different. Then we're gonna talk about promoting safety in the environment and preventing wandering and running away from home, which is a very, very difficult problem and often contributes to having people move from home into a nursing home or other care facility. So if you can have some tips from this show today as to how to decrease that problem, you will really have gotten something very important out of it. So let me again have the pleasure of introducing our spectacular guest <laughs> who's so amazingly uh, versed in all of these areas, Dr. Gloria Donnelly. Dr. Gloria Donnelly has done many things in her career. She has written textbooks, she has been a volunteer, she is obviously a distinguished professional in the Philadelphia community. But her real expertise in this area comes from the past 26 years where she and her husband Joe lived and cared for three elderly parents at home. And she will tell you, since they were both uh, only children, it really, the caretaking responsibilities did fall to she and her husband. But they have done such a spectacular job and their uh, parents lived to such ripe old ages, which is quite astounding. But she has learned from her own experience really how to advise us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why we have her as our guest today. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Gloria, for Thank joining you. us again. And so Thanks. tell us about dealing with the many faces of dementia. Right. Well, I can say that uh, by the time our care family caregiving uh, responsibilities had ended, all three of our parents, my mother, my father, and my mother-in-law had experienced dementia for part of the time, and, and then until their, their deaths. My mother's dementia uh, started when she was 80 years old, mm -hmm. and it had a nine-year course. My mother-in-law did not start with dementia until she was 99. That's a big difference. Yes. And my father also was 99 when he started with his dementia. And it was after having had two surgeries, two major surgeries after falls. And you know, uh, science and the literature will tell you that having general anesthesia at a very, very advanced age can sometimes do things to the brain that uh, uh, can create symptoms like dementia. Right. So dementia in, in this country is a huge problem. There are five million people now right. that are experiencing dementia. What's the projection on the that? The projection is by 2050 that will triple. Uh, so everyone is rushing to look for a quote cure um, so far, no cure. Right. So we have some medications that may slow the process down. Um, we were never successful with any of those medications because 
My mother, my father, and my mother-in-law had very adverse reactions to all of them. And so we had to learn to, as, as my husband and I say, we had, had to learn to roll with the process right. and really understand what was going on and realize that we were, uh, we were humans too, not superhumans, and that we would interact uh, with our loved ones who had dementia, sometimes as if they did not. Well, that was probably very healthy. Yes. That's very healthy. Let's go over <coughs> for our audience some of the signs and symptoms of okay. dementia. Right. Well, you know, th there are about, if you go to alz.org or you go to ADIR, which is the, the NIH website, they will all give you the early signs of dementia. So there's plenty out there on the Internet that will really give you these signs. But first of all, I think the first sign is short-term memory loss. Now by that, I don't mean you can't think of a word when you're speaking. I don't mean that kind of thing. I mean a pattern of memory loss that is short-term. That you do something, but you don't remember you did it. You go on to something else because you haven't finished what you uh, had started. You run into different difficulties or problems so it but it's a constant pattern of that right then you have uh, problems and challenges with planning and problem solving or even doing things that were you know normal parts of your everyday life for example my mother who was the consummate housekeeper forgot how to use the washing machine now that would be a major symptom. Yes. She could not figure out how to turn it on. She could go down the basement, she could put the load in the washer, and that would be it. She would have to call my father because she had lost that. Right. Uh, you have um, uh, time-place confusion. And sometimes my mother, who was really the first of the parents to experience dementia, and I would say hers was the severest and most long term, would ask where she was. Mm -hmm. Because time and place, and of course, you know, when, when we brought my mother to be evaluated uh, and they did the, you know, the little mini mental status, th they always ask who's the President of the United States, you know, questions right, like right. that, to see if you're really oriented to time and place. And of course, my mother didn't even know. Uh, so, so she was pretty advanced by the time we, we really got her formally diagnosed. Right. Um, Do you think that's common? I mean, I'm, I think I'm thinking is. that, you know, many people that mm -hmm. are listening to you describe this are probably doing their own mental checklist. Yes, that's right. And saying, I know someone that really is having these problems. Right. Now, Sh should they go have them f formally I think, evaluated? I, I think formal evaluation is good if you have that good primary care provider, someone who could really zero in and try to differentiate between dementia and maybe something else that's going on, like depression. You know, when you begin to lose your memory, when you're misplacing things, when, uh, when you, your judgment is poor, let's say when your filters are gone, that when you say something to somebody that you would not have normally ever said, even, you know, even if you might have. My mother-in-law had a great deal of difficulty with one of her caregivers who was of a different race. And she, she, one night called her a, a racial name and I almost fell off the chair because this was not something my mother-in-law ever would do. Right. She had beautiful manners. She was a very dignified woman, mm -hmm. but the filters were gone. Right. And so uh, those are the kinds of things that happen. Uh, withdrawal from social status. I, I, th I think with my mother, uh, I really couldn't tell in the beginning whether my mother was depressed or really beginning her dementia phase because she was socially withdrawing. She became very quiet, which was not her personality. Mm -hmm. 
And of course, those are signs of depression. Right. You know, uh, uh, you don't speak as much, your mood is down, uh, you may sleep a lot, you may kind of withdraw to your room. Uh, uh, and my mother wasn't like that. So the question was, in the beginning, was she depressed or was she uh, beginning her course of dementia? And how did you get an answer to that? Well, you know, back then, uh, it really wasn't until she was pretty advanced with her dementia that we really figured out depression. Her particular depression was specifically connected to the dementia. Because when you're losing memory, when you're confused, when you're having problems, problem, problem solving. I remember going to visit my mother before she moved in with us and she had had an episode where she couldn't figure out how to use the washer or how to use the stove right. or whatever. And she sat in a chair and cried because she knew oh, what was happening. Right. So there's an awareness right. that you're going through this process, that something's different, which can contribute to depressed mood. But if it's just depression and not dementia, you can do something about that. Right. There, there would be medication. Yes. There would be uh, therapeutic interventions just specifically for depression. But in this case, assuming that most people with dementia are going to have some form of depression just because of all the things that you've said, mm -hmm. that, that people have some awareness that may decline over time, but while they are still aware that they are basically losing it in, right. in the vernacular, in the ver right. um, that that is a very depressing situation. Yes, so it is. with the intervention, the help that they could get be different for, from uh, one from the other, I think that's well, really important to let people know yes. what they should do. Well, I, I think if certainly if there's an overlay of severe depression over the dementia, uh, m perhaps an antidepressant could help with that. But the antidepressant will not affect the dementia, the, the progression of the right, dementia. Right, right. It may make the person in the short term feel better. Mm -hmm. it, may, uh, it may help with mood. Right. But it's not going to have any right. impact. So from what you're saying, Gloria, it seems like the most valuable part of having that evaluation is really to let people know that there is something that could be done at least for the depression. Yes, yes. And if the issue is only depression, then the medication may be able to take care of it totally. Right, so you may think as an observer, as a family caregiver, mm -hmm. or as a friend of a friend who's having some of these problems, you may think that there may be signs of dementia, but that could be ruled out. Exactly, that's right. And that's why I, th I think the assessment is so important. Where do people go to get these assessments? Well, I think a good primary care provider that knows uh, the family that, that has a, uh, a background in taking care of the elderly right. can do this kind of an assessment. That's very important. Or a psychiatric nurse practitioner, a psychiatrist, and if the primary care provider is really working well with the family, the family should ask who would be the best to do the assessment. That's very good advice. Yeah. Right. But the first step is to get an assessment. And that would really help the person even if they are declining because they certainly are able to understand what, what the situation is and that would actually help them to right. have a better grasp of what is going on in their life. Right. And then there's not only depression, you know, sometimes with dementia comes agitation. So with my father, my father, uh, when his dementia began, he became extremely agitated, angry combative. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was a total uh, 360 degree turnaround from his usual personality. He was kind of a sweet man, a lot of fun, very low arousal, a great sense of humor, but when his depression, uh, his dementia began, he got very agitated and so of course I turned to our primary care provider and he said, okay, you know, there are lots of things we could try. Let's try this medication. Mm -hmm. And we put him on a medication. And 
I have to say, my father turned into a monster. So it made him worse. It made him worse. And so he had had three doses. It was a summer weekend, and he was trying to get out of the house. And I'll talk a little bit about making the house safe and secure. My mother-in-law, who was not in her dementia phase then, would watch him because they were friends. And my father was very clever. He was trying this door and that door. I was keeping an eye on him. My husband wasn't home at the time. And all of a sudden, I heard my mother-in-law yell, he got out. And of course, we live in a house near a train station. And I looked out the door. It was 95 degree, beautiful sunny day, but very hot. And my father, with his cane, is literally running down the hill toward the train station. Now, my father was a bus driver mm -hmm. in, in, in his youth, and he had been talking about the train. He knew that we were near a train. Right. I ran out the door. I ran, and you know, I'm, I'm elderly too, and I'm huffing and puffing to chase my father to, to get him. He crossed the street. He went up the incline to the, the platform, and lo and behold, even on a Saturday when the trains run every hour, as soon as he got there, the train pulled up. And I was, I was yelling and waving my arms to the conductor who had gotten off the train. And finally, she caught my eye. My father was on the third step, and we took him off the train. And I was huffing and puffing and very furious that he would have done this. But you know what's so amazing in listening is that when this man had a mission, he, he was, he was going to get did. there. He did. And I said to him, and where do you think you were going? He said, I was going to the bank in South Philly. I said, but Dad, the train is going to Lancaster. Right. He said, I'd have gotten there anyway. <laughs> and maybe he would have. And maybe uh, he would have. <laughs> but, so the hardest part then was pushing him up the hill, back to the house, and then we got into, I took him off the medication immediately. I called our primary care provider, and I said, I, I need to know given the fact that he's been on this medication for such a short period of time, do I have to wean him? Very important. Or could I just take him off? Right, so weaning means to step it down very gradually. Right. So it's not too much of a jolt to the system. And he said he's only been on it two days. Take him off. Right. But I, let's dissect this for a moment mm -hmm. because it's a very good example of how different people have different reactions to things. So. In the first case with uh, Gloria's mother, she was depressed as she so saw herself declining. In the case of her father, he became very angry and exactly. frustrated. Yes. So people do have very different reactions yes, to the same phenomena. And you can't necessarily account for the reactions. As a caregiver, your job is to try and intervene as best as possible. Now, the other thing that I think ca comes across is that even in his confusion, he knew that he wanted to be in charge. He yes. wanted to get somewhere. Exactly. He wanted to have mobility. He right. wanted to live like he used to live, and that is if he felt like going somewhere, he would just he go would out just and go. go. And of course, I was his daughter. I, didn't, I was not in a position, you see, to tell him he could not get on a train or he should get on a train. This was his decision. Even in his dementia, he was asserting his fatherly and his male rights. Right, right. But the reality is that Gloria did have to drag him off the train because right. he was confused and he would have been in trouble and he would have been lost wandering and the next thing you would have exactly. the police on your doorstep, which ha happens many, many times. So yes. I think that what did you do then? What was the next step in making the okay, house safe? Well, the next step was uh, my, my husband and I, the, the caregiver came later in the day. My hus We didn't have a full-time caregiver then. My husband and I went to the hardware store and we bought these very little stick-on door alarms. They were about two dollars each. Mm -hmm. And on every door where we knew my father might make his exit, right. we put one. And they had motion detectors in them. And that worked very well. Okay. So 
uh, of course, we have an alarm system in the house, and that worked at night, but my father didn't get up at night, not like my mother-in-law. And, and that's, you know, they're the differences right. in, in how people uh, respond. Right. But uh, in terms of safety, um, we, we had to buy a, get a, a chair glider because um, they could not navigate stairs. And that, that's, a, I think, a very big issue for the elderly. We had the, the uh, stair glider, I think, for five years. Right because uh, my father fell once mm -hmm. and broke a femur trying to eat a cookie and go up the stairs at the same time, which I don't think you could multitask like that right. when you're 99. Right. Uh, and so uh, uh, we had, we, you always worry about falls in the home. You worry about escaping. Right. You worry about what happens, and it, for my father, it was like clockwork, the sundowning. So at th between 3 and 4 o'clock, every single day, my father would experience extreme confusion. That's the sundowning. Uh, he, would, he would become agitated. He would want to get up mm -hmm. and wander around. He would go to the door and constantly check. That was another safety issue. The front door we had secured with three locks. Mm -hmm. We had the regular lock that he could open, you know, if he wanted to answer the door, which we never let, we, we couldn't at the end right. let him do. Right. We had a, a, a deadbolt lock that we had put in, and we had a little, um, you know, the kind of lock uh, where you slide the little chain, we had that lock right. there. And uh, because he would try to get out. So it was safety around falls, around steps, and around securing the environment. Right. There were plenty of places that he could roam in the house, and that was okay. But he could not go out right. because he would bolt. Right. But I think that what is really interesting in listening to your discussion of this, Gloria, is that you and your husband were really able to deal with all these clear behavioral issues and mm -hmm. problems. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, when that starts happening, they start looking for a placement, like where can they put their parent, where mm -hmm. they'll be safer. Can you talk a little bit about how you made that decision to really well, do this at <coughs> home versus really moving your parents into a, another facility? Right. Well, actually, when my father was becoming very agitated and difficult to manage, and when he tried to run away several times, we did uh, explore mm -hmm. placement. And the first place we went to, I had some connections, and it was a very nice place and, you know, very good people. But when we went to look at it, there was a, a big room with seven beds in it and you know the TV's hanging from the ceiling and I knew my father was a very private man it just would not work. Right. Uh, the other place we looked at had a unit that was just for patients with Alzheimer's and uh, it uh, the way it was configured I didn't think my father would be comfortable. And my father was always used to having family around. Right. He was from a big family, you know, eight kids. And, and even though I'm an only child and my husband is, uh, he was always there for my children, you know, grandchildren. He had great-grandchildren. And so when my husband and I talked about it, and we also looked at finances. It's expensive, mm -hmm. and if you if you put somebody in a nursing home that will eventually take Medicaid, then I guess it's okay. But you use up all your loved ones' resources, and then Medicaid kicks in. In some nursing homes that are not Medicaid associated, if you run out of money, you're you're out. Right, and so. Even though money was not a huge part of the consideration, it was, would, would enough family be visiting? 
right. would he be comfortable in that kind of right. setting? Uh, and so we sat down, we did an analysis, we looked at could we manage my father in the home and what would it take? And we, um, we had a full-time family caregiver. They took care of all three parents. Who, who took care of two because by, by that time my mother was right. gone. Right. She lived with us. She she had a day and a half a week off, which was her preference. Right. And uh, it was cost effective, and it worked out for her. I think that that's really to be admired because that kind of decision making is really what many families have to go through. And I think really hearing about how a couple who both had their own careers were able to do this and still maintain their jobs, which is a whole other discussion in itself. But having a family caregiver, someone that came in and took care of two people and did it well, got to know the routines, it obviously really worked because all of her parents lived to very advanced ages, more than what most of us are going to need. Mm. <laughs> Who knows? But anyway, I just want to thank our guest today, Dr. Gloria Donnelly for being with us for our next installment on Tales uh, of a Caregiver, Family Caregiver, because it is that practical experience and that lived experience that really makes the difference. Gloria is a, a nurse uh, by training. She is an astute professional, but there's nothing like the real thing. And, and you really don't learn these lessons unless you've actually done it. You cannot read much of this in books and really know how to really problem solve. So I think that really listening to her problem solving should be very helpful and really translating that for you so that you can use some of these same tips in your situation. So let me just again review that we have talked today about how dementia is growing in the United States. Five million people today and 15 million people projected by 2050 is really going up a very steep curve with no uh, sight line for any kind of cure. So we really don't see any cures coming down the pike. So we are going to really be, as a society, dealing with these problems at home. So we talked about memory loss, the whole concept of sun sundowning, and the personality changes and how to deal with them. We also talked about dementia and depression and how they overlay one another. There's an overlap and how important it is to have that assessment so that you really know what you're dealing with and there are some interventions, at least for the depression, not necessarily for the dementia, but any kind of intervention that works is certainly a gain for that person and for you as the family caregiver. Then we talked briefly about the environment and preventing wandering and how to really have the nuts and bolts, so to speak, approach to really having your house safe for those that are going to be inside of your house. We also talked briefly about the assessment of w whether or not to put your family member into uh, a facility. And I think that really warrants another show mm -hmm. to really discuss that kind of assessment in more depth. I want to thank you all for listening today because I hope that you will take some of this information and use it with people that you know uh, because it's really important that we try to find as a community new and better ways to intervene with a problem that is growing in, in our society. So I want to thank you for joining us and remember with health all things are possible. Have a wonderful day. I hope you enjoyed our conversation today and that the information will help you in meeting your health goals. Catch this program and other conversations on the website, drnancyrn.com. Or you can write to me as well. I welcome your comments and feedback. Thank you for listening and join us again. And remember, with health, all things are possible.